Recently, I heard someone call him the Mick Jagger of intellectuals. For over 30 years, he has been a philosopher, publisher, author of more than 30 books, including Barbarism with a Human Face and Who Killed Daniel Pearl. He is a playwright, journalist, filmmaker, defender of causes across the globe, co-founding the anti-racist group SOS Racism. Known as a provocateur, he has challenged and counseled world leaders and served on diplomatic missions for the French government. He has been called a tribal sage, a visionary, and perhaps a prophet, speaking out in defense of Israel and against the return of anti-Semitism. Also named one of the 50 most important Jews in the world and the most important intellectual in France, Monsieur Levy has now turned his thoughts to his Jewish heritage, to our Jewish heritage, in his new book, The Genius of Judaism, in which he explains how his ideas are shaped by the wisdom and beauty of Judaism, why Judaism and Jewish peoplehood are so important to the world, and why the global resurgence of anti-Semitism poses an existential threat to us all. After this program, we will have time for questions, as well as book sales and signing. But for now, please welcome Bernard-Henri Levy. by just addressing two comments to those of you who are gathered here. The first is that um, because we're being taped by C-SPAN, it's very important that you laugh at the appropriate places. <laughs> and also, uh, we have asked uh, our guest if instead of addressing his answers to me, which is the natural thing to do, to look out at you because of the C-SPAN cameras. Um, so the second is that I'm going to try to be as explicit and careful as I can in my questions, because even though, um, as you will hear, uh, our guest speaks uh, magnificent English, nonetheless, I think to conduct an interview in one second or third language is not an easy endeavor. And so I hope that you will be patient with both of us as we try to explore this quite remarkable book, The Genius of Judaism. And I want to begin by asking you the following, which is, obviously, you are more than familiar with the work of one of your French philosophical predecessors, Jean-Paul Sartre, and you know his book, Anti-Semite and Jew. That book was criticized because it suggested in some ways that the anti-Semite gets to decide what the Jew is, that you're defined by outside forces instead of by yourself. And so I wonder why you chose to begin a book about the genius of Judaism by talking about anti-Semitism instead of talking about Judaism itself. It is the best question to start with. Let me say first of all how, how happy I am to be here. Uh, I said it just before to a little group of uh, us. Uh, for me to, to be hosted this place, in this Wilshire temple, is more than a joy. It is a great honor and it was a dream of my life to be here, to be received here and to have the honor to speak in this place, which is such a denial of the stupid theory of the opposition between Jewishness and art between Jewishness and images, which is uh, such a more complicated thing than s what say some of our enemies. It's such a treat, such a joy, such an honor to be here. And even more, with Rabbi David Volpe, who is in America, in Anglo-Saxon world in general, a legend. And I am really honored to be here on this stage, sharing it with Rabbi Volpe. <laughs> to reply. 
reply to his question. It is the question which I ask, which I ask myself when I began the writing of this book. It is true that the Jew has not come in this world to discuss anti-Semitism. It is true that anti-Semitism is more than anything else boring. It is true that when I reply on the TV to the question of the rise of anti-Semitism, I have the feeling to lose a few minutes of my life. It is true that to enter in the psychology of an anti-Semite, to try to understand his reasons, is com something completely absurd and disgusting. And by the way, it is not what I do in this book. The chapter about anti-Semitism, which is the s s first chapter of the book, is not devoted to that at all. I don't try to enter in the reasons of the of the the malin of the evil. I try to say because anti-Semitism is is in progress because it is a, 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 a proceeding on every front and not only in Europe, also in America. I could not start this book without mentioning it and without saying how I conceive the resistance of it. Not how to convince the anti-Semite, I will not convince them. Not how to understand them, I don't care about them. They are, most of them, illiterate, stupid people. Not even the sort, if I compare in France, the anti-Semites of today and those of the 30s, there is such an abyss between them. In the 30s, alas, for my grandfather, my grandfather's anti-Semitism could have, could brag to have some great writers bearing the flag. Louis Ferdinand Céline was not a zero, far from it. Drieu La Rochelle was a good writer. Paul Morand was a great writer, of course. Today, there is nothing really rednecks of the thoughts, really stupid, uh, 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 non-thinking uh, 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 women and men. So I don't, the, lead, the chapter about anti-Semitism is not devoted to that. It is devoted to reply to the question how to contain, how to resist, and how to win and prevail about the anti-Semitism. How to be stronger than them. The only questions which the anti-Semitism addresses to me, to you, Rabbi, and to all of you, is how to do in order to be stronger than them. We are not going to cure them. We are not going to understand them. We are not going to convince. We just have to be stronger. And in these pages of the beginning of the book, I try, strong of my experience, strong of what Rabbi Volpe just said, this very bad season, this very bad age in the history of Jewry which was opened by Sartre. This idea of Jean-Paul Sartre, that I was a Jew only because a non-Jew saw me as a Jew, was a horrible idea was a, a minorizing idea. Was, uh, it consisted in transforming the Jew in nearly nothing, uh, a shadow, an effect of the look of the other. So my idea in this chapter is to try, in my modest way, I'm not at all a prophet, I'm a little Jew. I am a little Jew trying to know more, trying to get into the secrecy, the mystery, and the greatness of Judaism. But the little Jew who I am has a little experience and a little knowledge on, about how to be strong enough to be stronger than them. This is what I try to say in this chapter. So, understanding that we suffer from a low quality of anti-Semite, in fact,
fact, what you do here is incredibly important, and I found it helpful, and I don't doubt that you will too, which is that you try to address the best arguments of anti-Semitism and talk about why they're fallacious. So, for example, you don't address Holocaust denial, which is stupid, but you do address why the Holocaust can't be compared in some ways to any other um, tragedy in history. Would you tell us something about that? What makes it different and what should we know because the analytical power of that is very, is, is very potent? Yes, uh, this question is very important because one of the pillars of the new anti-Semitism is the Holocaust denied. It is one of the pillars. The, uh, there is uh, a way to say the, the Jews are horrible beings because they traffic, exaggerate, or invent what should be the most sacred thing for them, which is the memory of their martyrs. This is how the denial of Holocaust turns into anti-Semitism. It, it depicts a portrait of the Jew capable, able to the worst, which is uh, um, making up and uh, uh, the, the, his, um, the most saint memory which he has. So the question is really, I, I try faithfully and thoroughly to raise the question of what is, at the end of the day, is the unicity of Holocaust? Why is the Holocaust a massacre, unprecedented, until now without any real following? Why is it so special? It is not a question of number of deaths. It is not a question of uh, planification, as it is sometimes said. There are some genocides which have been planified. Uh, it is not the, the, re the speed or the rhythm of the massacre. The genocide in Rwanda has probably the world record of the speed of the massacre. It is not... Uh, I, I take a few um, uh, generally said uh, reasons of this unicity. And I reach the conclusion that there is two things which make the genocide of the Jews, the Holocaust, absolutely unique. Two. Number one, the Holocaust made the world, uh, the entire world, a trap for all the Jews. Entire world. For a Cambodian, or for a, a man of Rwanda, or even for an Armenian, there was some possibilities of exit. If he could, which was practically very difficult, but in theory, if a Cambodian could escape to Vietnam, if an Armenian could uh, escape from the desert of Syria, he was safe. For the Jews, there was no safe place in the world. The project of the Hitlerians was to eradicate, to kill the Jews wherever they could be. And the theoretical project was, again, to make the entire world a trap for the Jewish prey considered as a prey. So, no recourse. And the second specificity, mathematical, it is not a, it is not a creed. It's a fact that it is the only genocide which has been supposed to be, which was supposed to be without rest, without any piece of the body remaining safe. All the other genocides, as cruel as they could be, had, I would not say a limit, but in some case, the, genos, the, genos, the, the perpetrators of the genocide decided to spare the old people. In other cases, they decided to, to, to spare the children. In other cases, they did not care about the books. They did not care about the memory. They did not care about the dead, for example. The Holocaust is the first genocide, the history of genocide, which was a total project of destruction. Nothing had to be left. No human living body, no human dead body, and not even this other living body, which is the letter, the word of the book, 
remaining in the, in the world. No member of these people having to remain alive. These are the two specificities of this genocide. And this is what entitles the, the scholars of the Holocaust without any satisfaction, of course, it, it would be so better if it was not the case, but it is that which entitles the scholars of the Holocaust to say that it is as a sort of standard of inhumanity, that it is a sort of climax of the evil which the man can do to the other man. And what I say also in this chapter is that far from discouraging the world to take care of the other massacres, far from consisting in a sort of a monopole, monopoly of the suffering, this way of thinking the Holocaust as an absolutely special massacre is an invitation to, to be aware, to, to get the first signs and to be able to resist to any other massacre or outrage to humanity. I show in the book, and again it is not a, it is not a creed, it's a fact, that since I am in age, in the age of involved myself and to see and to think each time in our history since 50 years, each time that the smell of genocide has come back. Each time that a huge massacre has begun, those who gave the alert, those who went on the bridge and on the rampart first were always, not the Jews, but those who had in their heart, in their memory and in their intelligence this idea of the specificity of the Holocaust. It was that in Bangladesh in the 70s. It was that in Bosnia-Herzegovina. It was the case in Darfur. It was the case in Rwanda. This perception of the specificity of the Holocaust gives to those who take it seriously a sort of sixth sense, a sort of radar of inhumanity which makes that they are always the first to, to, to feel, to know, and to fight. And this is very important because one of the arguments of the new anti-Semitism is to say that if you give too much to the Jews, you will have nothing left to the Rwanda, for the Rwanda. One of the major arguments is that there is no enough space in the human heart to have sorrow for the Jews and for the Darfuri. It is the opposite. It is when your heart has a real and clear knowledge of what happened really to the Jews, that by experience I know that, that you are immediately aware and immediately on the bridge for the other massacres and genocides. That is a, it's a wonderful prelude to what I want to ask you next. It also reminds me of the writer Cynthia Ozick, who has a beautiful image. She said that the shofar has a narrow end and a broad end. But if you start off by blowing in the broad end, you get nothing. If you start off by blowing in the narrow end, you get a sound everyone can hear. And what I want to ask you is, what made you? Is it, do you think, your Jewish legacy, your understanding of the Holocaust, what made you continually throughout your life go to places where people were in danger and thereby also in danger yourself since you could have lived a very comfortable and renowned life without traveling to all the places, only some of which you recount in here, and, and making common cause with people in danger? There are probably many, many reasons for that. And... Uh probably some intimate reasons, uh, some family uh, motives. Uh, I don't know if I have to enter in that here, but in one word, I, I come from a... In France, there is a real strong dividing line. 
devoted to his father, who loves his father, I suppose that I had that in the back of my mind. I suppose that I had the, the will to try to be worth of the message, of the inner heritage, and of the glory of my father. This is the intimate reason. After that, there is there are of course other reasons, more intellectual. And they relate to what we just said. It relates, they relate to my way of being a Jew in two regards. Number one, what I said about Holocaust. Again, someone who has in his heart and in his intelligence and better at the junction of the two, this burning wound of the memory of Holocaust cannot be indifferent to what can happen in the various places I just quoted and in which I went. And exactly as when I heard about the martyrdom of the American young Jewish reporter Daniel Pearl, I received it as a physical shock as an absolute obligation to commit myself to go on his footsteps to, uh, to, to, to honor and celebrate his name if I dare say my dear rabbi exactly as I did for Daniel Pearl who was uh, a name of course I did the same for so many unnumbered dead unnamed dead without any grave dead all over the world. And this idea of a bunch of women and men dead in packs, dead without grave, without name, without number, and without memory, without archives, without archives, without leaving a trace in the memory of mankind, it is true that this idea has made me all my life crazy and ill. And I devoted a little part of my time, not enough, not enough, to try to give back a name, to give back a, a trace, to just figure the proper number to these outnumbered deaths. This is one thing. Another thing is more deeply to what is properly Judaism, more accurately related to what I call the genius of Judaism. For me to be a Jew means in a way which I, I try to express in this book, to care about the other. The question of, Jude, of being a Jew, I often, I often hear People ask me, what about your Jewish identity? I'm always embarrassed by this idea of identity because I, I'm not so sure that Judaism is a matter of identity, which means to be the same of uh, ourselves. The real challenge for a Jew, the real stake, the real work, is the relation not with the ID, but with the other. And uh, for me, the most challenging way to relate to the other is the way in which the most enigmatic prophet in my eyes, Jonah, acts, Jonah, when he goes to Nineveh, he goes to the biggest otherness goes to the proper embodiment of the absolute otherness. And he deals with that. And he, he speaks to that. He's, he tries to save that, this city of Philly. For me, being a Jew means that all my life, at least all the part of my life where I felt deeply and affirmatively Jew, has consisted in fighting 
message, the lesson of the prophet Jonah. I'm a little Jew faithful to the prophet Jonah and this book is a praise to Jonah. It's an attempt to unfold the lesson of Jonah. Uh, there is in this book, and I will probably say that it is the core of it, after so many commentaries, after, after Sforno, after Malbim, after all an attempt to add uh, a tiny drop of ink to the commentary of Jonah. My life has consisted in doing that, and this book, which is a summary of my life, is an attempt to express that. Something I would, I'd like to preface my next question with, which you may not know because most of you haven't yet had a chance to read the book, is that the same sense of depth and force that you hear in Bernard Henri Lévy's speaking actually comes through in the book as well. It is written in a sort of Vatic prophetic style, and so you will have that experience when you read the book, just as I know you're grateful for having it being here this evening. And and I think that the arc of our conversation has followed in some ways the arc of the book, which is beginning with anti-Semitism, opening into concern for the other, and the way in which Judaism, and especially Jonah, illustrates it. So let's stick with Jonah for a second. Those of you who remember the story, God tells Jonah to, to speak to, to the city of Nineveh, which is a hated city in ancient times and in Israel. And Jonah doesn't want to do it. He runs away. He gets swallowed by a fish. And eventually, the fish spits him up. He goes to Nineveh. I'm skipping a few parts, but that's the idea. And in fact, I remember many years ago hearing a comment from a, uh, a, a, a wonderful rabbi in Israel who passed away a year or two ago, Rab Amiel, who said, why does Jonah get to be a prophet considering the fact that he ran away from God? And his answer is because Jonah, unlike the rest of us, only ran away from God once. And so that's what I want to ask you is, does the Jewish tradition, does part of the genius of Judaism that you speak about here mandate that belief in God, and especially in the, in the teaching of your teacher Levinas, that being in God's presence is less theological and belief than it is sort of anthropological and and living life the way that you spoke about the best moments of your life and your father's life. That is, it's about the other as opposed to about the one. Levinas said it in another way. Levinas said that uh, Judaism was uh, more than an optic. It was a practice. Optic meaning uh, a look. Optic, a look at, uh, at the sky. And practice meaning a link with the others. Levinas used to say that. Levinas who very often said that one of his um, uh, concern was to get rid as much as possible of the religion. He said Judaism is not a religion. Paganism is a religion. Christianism is a religion. Idolatry is a religion. There is the religious spirit uh, be behind under every little stone, the task, the target of the Jew is to reduce the quantity of religion in the world. Rosenzweig, Franz Rosenzweig, probably one of the most important German-speaking uh, master of Judaism in the 20th century, wanted to, to, to stick in front of his little house of study, I am irreligious. He said that to Alio, his uh, fellow uh, uh, student. The experience of the so many great masters of Judaism is the experience not of the presence but of the retreat of God. The Tzimtzum, Rabbi Haim of Volozin, who is one of the inspirers I modestly follow in this book, has as his main philosophical experience this terrible test of the world becoming suddenly devoid of God. 
is a risk for the world which has been created to decreate itself. This is the most vertiginous hypothesis of Haim of Volosin. Is the hypothesis of the of a possible decay, collapse, ruin of the world due to this timsum of God. Then what do the men and women have to do? This is a real Jewish question according to him. His reply is that they have to pray toward an empty sky and they have to study and to interpret ad infinitum endlessly the holy text and that it is their words which will be like the the wooden uh, uh, charpent of the world that the world will hold against this threat and imminence of disaster and collapse because of the study of the little Jews which is all of us so this for me is the, 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 the crucial question and uh, I try to say at the, at the end of the book probably because I'm a secular Jew uh, probably because I am not uh, familiar with the, the rituals who are so important in the Jewish life probably but my feeling is that one of the difference let's say it this way one of the difference between Christianity and Judaism is that for a Jew, the biggest requirement, what is required more than anything else from a Jew, is less to, to believe than to study and to understand. And to bring, to add an addition of intelligence to the world. A Christian a Christian believes, of course. A Christian has nothing more important than to, to jump in belief, to make the economy of all the steps, all the scales, which the Jews never avoid in the very work of the commentary. A Christian says, okay, let's forget all these uh, details, all this labyrinth of comment. Let's jump to the bet. Blaise Pascal, the French great Pascal. There is a great beauty in this gesture to, to, to stop speaking, to stop thinking, just betting and jumping. My feeling is that a Jew does not jump. A Jew does not bet. A Jew never stops commenting studying, adding a paradox to another paradox, and so on. And there is a great quote of Gaon of Vilnius, the Gaon of Vilnius, who was asked one day by one of his students, Rabbi Gaon, if you had to choose between on one side a lazy student who is never here in the school but who believes, and a, a hard worker student who uses, who abuses all the strength of his mind and of sometimes of his body, who really dies on the work of the commentary, but who doubts, who would you choose? Gaon of Vilnius says that, of course, he prefer not to have to choose. But if he had to, he would prefer the hard worker who, de who devotes his life to the commentary and to revive and make more and more vibrant the letters of the text, but who doubts than the lazy one. Who and this for me is one of what in this book, The Genius of the Day. I'm now going to ask you a very pedestrian question that a rabbi would ask. 
the idea that Judaism is about argumentation and study and text and ideas and searching is a beautiful and wonderful and inspiring idea, and I don't think anybody here would object to it. But can Judaism survive if people don't know Hebrew, don't keep kosher, don't keep the Sabbath, don't do rituals, which are specific to Judaism, whereas ethics is not? You can care about other people and be any religion or no religion, but nobody who prays in Hebrew isn't Jewish, or very, very few. So I wonder if in an attempt to sort of grab the Empyrean, we're not losing something of the everydayness that also maintains places like this. You are right. That's enough. Okay. No, no, no. Sorry. No, oh. it's not enough because More. you are half right. <laughs> The Jews have specifically a certain way of eating, of meeting, and of speaking. And the relationship to Hebrew, for example, is crucial. And when I say that I'm a little Jew, I mean, between other things, that I am uh, so disappointed at myself to be still so, so, so remote, so foreign to the uh, language. But I don't agree to say that everyone take care of the otherness. I don't think that this concern of the other is uh, common to all uh, monotheistic religions. At least, let's say it in another way. I do believe that there is a real Jewish way very specific, comparable to nothing else, to live under the shadow of the other or to, to, to put his own shadow on the other and to comment the text. The Christian comments, of course. The Muslims comment sometimes, the Hadith and those who are faithful to that. But there is what being a Jew means also having a very special way of commenting. And I would just like to take one example, which is in the book, which is uh, makes a few pages of the book. I will uh, sum it in a few words. There is a great page of Rashi commenting a verse saying that the, the Torah has to be read as if it had a face. And Rashi said, Rashi says that this verse means three things which are very specific to Jews which you, you will not find in any Christian commentator. Rashi says that to say that the verse has to be read as if it has a face number one means that the verse, the text is a living body it is never frozen it is never dead. It has nothing to do with a dead letter which the Christian, for example, opposes to the vibrant spirit. The letter is living as itself. Letters are living beings. Number one. Number two, Rashi says this image has of the face of the verse has to be taken even more seriously and literally. Literally. A face is a face, he says. A face is the face of the text. Okay, but this is a metaphor. The face is the face of the reader. And this verse has to be understood in a way that does that the, the woman or the man who reads the verse finds his own face in the very process of the reading. To be a Jew means to believe that when you read a verse, when you commit yourself to the commentary of the Torah, you find your face. And you find your proper face. And you find, therefore, your proper subjectivity. The Jewish idea of being related to the text means that it is the best way to jump out of the rank of the animals, of the evil doers, all of the materials, and to become a real subject. This is a Jewish idea. And Rashi says a third thing. Rashi says that this, that the verse has not exactly, has not to be read as if he had only one face, but he says that it has to be read as if, as if he had, the verse, 70 faces. And Rashi wonders about this number of 70. Why? Has 
the verse to be read as if it had 70 faces. 70 is not 12. It is not the number of the tribes. It is the number of the nations. And Rashi says that the singularity, the specificity of the Jewish experience of the text and of a commentary is to address a convocation to all the nations of the world, to all the human beings, to find their true face in the face-to-face -face with the verse. So this way of relating yourself, you know that better than me, uh, Rabbi Volpe, but this way of reading a verse, this way of relating oneself to the text is a very special way. You can, the Christian can say whatever they want, or the Muslims, they have their own beauty, they have their own uh, highness, of course, but not this one. And this is as specific to Judaism as the use of the Hebrew, uh, as the, the practice of the Kashrut, and so on. It is a second pillar. And I, I don't believe in a Judaism, I'm sorry, who would just be content, who would just be happy with living a Jewish life, with the great rhythm of the Shabbat and of the saint days and feast and letting us living aside this great task of ordering, asking, escorting the nations to this finding of their own face in the discovery. So the before we take questions, and I'm going to take questions next, what you remind me of is that you, you say in this book that the great division is not between Orthodox and non-Orthodox, or between left and right, it's between thinking Jews and non-thinking Jews. And I would like you to give your definition, if you would, um, if you remind, there's a Hasidic story about uh, Rabbi Simcha Bunim, who was walking with his students, and he pointed at some Hasidim, and he said, they're dead. And they said, what do you mean they're dead? He said, they don't ask questions anymore. And they walked on for a minute, and one of his students said, Rabbi, how do I know I'm not dead? He goes, because you asked. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you see, how do you make that division that Rabbi Simcha made between who's a thinking Jew and who's not a thinking Jew? And I'm asking that seriously without being at all facetious or funny because maybe some of us are non-thinking Jews but if we hear your encouragement to be thinking we will rethink our non-thinkingness I think uh, no, this is of course the correct question I'm so angry when I hear some uh, lazy analysis about all of that I am uh, a secular Jew and my relationship to the Jewish life you are evoking is, to be frank, very light. So I don't belong to the world of the ortho, of what, of the men in black. I don't belong to this world. But I'm so cross. I'm so angry when I see them reduced to a sect of uh, obscurantists. Uh, frozen in their orthodoxy. This is just not fair. And I invite in the book, I invite the Jews and uh, those who, who, who want to be familiar with Jews to overcome this stupid division. Because what does it mean to be an orthodox? Orthodox is a Greek word which means to believe that there is one orthodoxa, one right opinion. And this right opinion is right forever. It cannot be changed. It cannot be uh, embittered. Uh, it is uh, frozen in its rightness. I'm sorry, but my friends, 
very familiar here, but it is a, it has been an important name for me, and it is important in the French Jewishness. He was a, 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 a former man of my generation. He was a rebu an extreme leftist revolutionary in the 60s. He was the chief of the French Maoist. He went uh, in China to see uh, not Mao Tse Tung, but Birle. He was the secretary of Jean-Paul Sartre. And he is the man, he is the one who converted Jean-Paul Sartre, by the way. He converted Jean-Paul Sartre from this stupid idea of uh, Jewishness being nothing else than the reflect of the eye of the other to the idea of an affirmative Jewishness. And Benny Levy, in the second part of his life, at, at the end of the most spectacular teshuva of the history of the great uh, Jewish scholars, became a man in black. He became a man in black. My, my, my dear friend, who was, uh, as he often said, he, he was the inventor of the Palestinians. I remember when we had a, a discussion in France, in, an, uh, in the Sorbonne, and there was always a crazy guy at the end of the lecture who said, yeah, but what do you do with the Palestinian cause? And Benny Levy was so funny with his big hat and his, and his dress. And he said, come on, please. the Palestinian, you tell me. I invented them when I was an extreme leftist, when I was a Moist. So this man became the most devoted uh, stud uh, man of study in Jerusalem and so on. He was the opposite of an orthodox. He was the contrary. There was no, no, as the Talmud says, he never, even if he had always the same hat and the same rodingot, he never wore garments which had been already worn by somebody else, which is the, the, the true formula for a, 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 a genuine Jewish experience. So this idea of orthodoxy is a, a crazy idea, a lazy idea, entertained and created by those who, do, who don't like Judaism and don't understand anything to, to it and are not um, embodied by the Hahabat Israel, which is the love of the Jewish people and of the Jewishness. On the other side, you have some secular Jews whom I would call orthodox. The secular Jews who repeat, I would not make politics here, but who repeat the same mottos, the same secular mottos as a sort of uh, uh, a meal of prayer and they are in a way orthodox and they are more orthodox than my friend Benny Levy. So the real dividing line is not this one. The real dividing line is between those who believe that Judaism is a, is a, is a test, is an adventure of the spirit, is a metaphysical uh, journey and those who believe in the comfort of being a Jew. To be a Jew is not comfortable. Since the first day at the foot of the Sinai, when Moses came to the all the little Jews of this time, Moses knew that the law had been proposed to all the nations of the earth. He knew the secret. He knew that the, the deal, as we say now in America, as some say today in America, the deal has be, had been proposed to all the nations that all of them refused. And he proposed it in despair, of course, to the poor little Jewish people who accepted the burden, who accepted to, to do and to hear, and then to hear. They knew, Moses knew, the Jews knew, the companion of Moses knew, except Korah and his mates who believed that it was easy, they knew that to be a Jew is not an easy task. That to be a Jew is not a comfortable state. They knew that it is not even a state. To be a, you are not a Jew. I'm sorry, Rabbi, but you are not a Jew 36, 65 days of the year, all the years of your life and all the moments of your day. There is a moment where you are more Jews than others. To be a Jew is not just a, is not a grace to fall on your head and which you just have to understand.
entertain a sort of spiritual capital is much more uneasy than that. And there is, to name for the last time, my master Emmanuel Levinas, 